Welcome, I'm Steve Winnick of the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress, and this is a presentation of the Homegrown 2021 Homegrown at Home concert series. In normal non-pandemic years, we hold our concert series in the historic Coolidge Auditorium and Whittall Pavilion of the Library of Congress. But since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been doing them online as homegrown at home concert series. This is our second series of virtual concerts. And it is now in fact, January, 2022, but we are doing an interview with Bennett Konesny who performed in the 2021 series. So Bennett, welcome to the homegrown 2021 concert and interview series. Thanks, Steve, great to be here. So you performed a, a, a wonderful set of work songs from the state of Maine with a large chorus of other singers. So explain a little bit about your early life and musical background that brought you to this point. Well, I, okay. I, I was raised off the coast of Maine on an island called Islesboro and uh, also on shore on, in America, as we call it, in a little town called Appleton, both uh, mid-coast main towns. Um, and to go back and forth, you have to take a ferry in Penobscot Bay. And in Penobscot Bay, we've got America's largest collection of uh, schooners sailing still to this day, over 20, um, mostly two-masted tall ships, uh, Applying the tourist trade these days, mm -hmm. any, anywhere from two hours to 10 days, maybe even some of them do two week trips still. Um, and it's really a way of keeping the old boats alive, giving people a chance to see the coast of Maine and, uh, you know, really um, keep our heritage alive, I guess I could say. We're, we're famous up here for great shipbuilding and just amazing sailing grounds. And, mm -hmm. uh, when I was a teenager, I decided I wanted to get on board one of those boats and be a deckhand. And pretty quickly, uh, the shanties um, came into my life just from doing that work, uh, raising the sails, bringing up the anchor, uh, and particularly on the schooner J and E Riggin, which had a musical captain uh, and crew. Uh, so there would be music every day in one form or another on board the boat. and. Um, after that, I got into farming and started working on uh, actually my first job before the schooners was raking blueberries here in Maine. And then um, I started working on organic farms when I was in college. And uh, they all my the people I was working with wanted me to sing sea shanties while we were farming. And so that sort of brought this uh, the idea of, well, wait a minute, um, these shanties are really uh, work songs, they can help with any sort of work that needs doing. And that led me into sort of asking, well, what did farmers used to sing? Mm -hmm. and, and learning about uh, people working in the woods, the lumberjacks and the wood cutting songs and the songs of the, of the shanties and the, up the Penobscot and the Kennebec River here in Maine. And one thing led to another and I ended up um, back home. I started a farm in New York. I started a farm in Vermont, but finally came home and uh, started a farm here in Belfast, Maine, which is on the Penobscot, on Penobscot Bay, and started a community chorus to revive uh, work songs. I'd, I'd had a Watson Fellowship and traveled all over the world. I've been to over a dozen countries collecting work songs, finding people who are still working and singing, whether it be in Tanzania, Ghana, Mongolia, Switzerland, Scandinavia, um, and finding a way to see how, how do work songs work in real life and how can we make it happen here? So I started a community chorus here, which is all about reviving really Maine's old, old work songs, whether they're shanties, sea shanties or songs from the lumber camps and, um, and mainly from the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's who you saw in the video and that's sort of what my life is revolving around these days. That's great. So, um, so you mentioned going to other countries to research work songs. And did you find in those places that there were uh, a lot of songs associated with farm labor, with farming work? Uh, yeah, it depends on where you are. Um, for instance, I thought in Ghana that there would be lots of farming songs because I had actually heard about 
over just down the coast in Liberia, um, rice working so songs for farming rice from the Capelle uh, people. But in Ghana, I couldn't find any farming songs, um, but a ton of fishing songs, which so that was kind of interesting. Fishermen singing day in, day out, the whole time. Pretty amazing. So when I got to Tanzania, I thought, well, maybe it's going to be the same. Instead, the Zakuma in uh, northwest Tanzania have one of the most sophisticated uh, and deep traditions of singing and farming, all documented by the great um, ethnomusicologist Frank Gunderson um, mm -hmm. out of Florida. And uh, this is a tradition where they wake up every morning, get their neighbors and friends together, go to a small plot and weed um, sorghum and corn and um, uh, tomatoes, whatever it is that they're growing at the time, mostly sorghum. Um, and then, or planting, um, cultivating. <clears throat> and as they're doing their farm work, they're practicing songs that their leader dreams up in the middle, in the, you know, in the early morning hours, writes down. And then as they're singing and farming, they're also developing dance routines that they use to compete at uh, harvest festivals each, uh, basically during the harvest time. And they win prizes, cash prizes or or uh, other other sorts of prizes by out competing their fellow uh, music musical farming groups. So it's it's an incredibly diverse, incredibly deep tradition that inspired me to then come back home and start something like that here. The idea being, well, we could do that here with our friends and neighbors to stack the firewood or or stack the garlic or whatever it is that needs doing in our farming community. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And one of the major crops that you grow is garlic, isn't that right? Yeah. So I, I've got a, a large uh, plot of garlic. It's definitely one of the largest plots in Maine here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's all pretty much, uh, all most of the work is done by the chorus. Uh, my community chorus will come together and meet on the farm and do that work on the farm. And then we'll go to one of the members of this this chorus, uh, they might have work that they need done at their place. So we'll go to their place. I've got a one of the members, Elliot Van Pesky, has a farm and he needed um, saplings pulled out of his fence lines. He's got electric fences for he's got dozens and dozens of um, cattle and and sheep. And so electric having working electric fences is key. And here we've got saplings always coming up in the field edges. So it's quite easy to pull the sapling at certain times of the year. So we'll bring the chorus over there, go along his fence lines and clean out his fence lines. So that's the kind of thing we do. It works really well. Uh, I've also was in Mongolia and Switzerland and they have, you know, herding songs for dealing with animals and livestock. Mm -hmm. And so kind of interesting to be working with Elliot, who's got his own huge uh, livestock operation. And um, my dream is one day that we have somebody, well, I, my dream is that somebody calls me and says, hey, you learned how to sing to livestock in Mongolia in order to get orphaned babies to be adopted by their, by their parents or by, by a different mother. Will you come and do that for our lamb? And I've actually had a couple calls, uh, uh, but nothing, um, the timing didn't work out. I wasn't able to get there in time, basically, to do the singing. So maybe that'll that's in the future. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a shame that it didn't work out, but but what yeah. a cool idea. Yeah. So so I mean, one of the things that kind of strikes me in listening to to you talking about this is that um, I'm not aware, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that farm work of that kind in New England was done with work songs. That is, mm. I don't know of a lot of examples of that recorded. Um, and so you're essentially applying principles that you learned elsewhere in the world to your own backyard. Is that is that right? Yes and no. I mean, the the I wanted to find a living living work song traditions to really dig into how it was being, you know, what are the uh, technical details of how to lead a work song in working context. Um, things, some of that I had learned on the schooners because we were, we were actually sure. using them to bring up the anchor and put up the sails. Um, but then there's also a much larger uh, uh, cultural piece around how to organize groups and convince people that this is worth doing and that's actually more productive, more efficient, and more fun to do it this way. And that was the kind of thing that I picked up 
in uh, other countries because we don't, you know, on the schooners, it's more of like, a, yes, we can't get these sails up without everyone's help. And so here's a song. And this is part of the, this is what we're, we're on a schooner in Maine. We're tourists. We're going on a schooner in Maine. And Bennett's going to lead a, a shanty to get the sails up. Um, so it's kind of a, a mix, you know, I have this um, the, from the schooners, this knowledge of of one level of organizing people in one context with one certain type of song. Now, as far as farming and farming songs, um, we don't have a, a broad understanding and knowledge of people singing while farming in New England in the same way that you see in Tanzania, for instance. But we do have the uh, Shaker tradition and um, uh, from the little amount that I've gone and read and researched Shaker singing, um, there's all of these anecdotes like, well, we're out in the herb garden singing, you know, or this song, you know, this, this one particular refrain or tis a gift to be, you know, simple gifts would come up or other songs would come up. And, um, I haven't gotten to talk with brother Arnold about this yet, but hmm. who was it? I was talking with Chris Moore maybe, or, or reading some of these books, their books. Um, there's several really interesting books about shaker music out there. And there's, there are these little anecdotes about working in the fields. Another one, I feel like um, Dudley Lofman lives over near in Canterbury, New Hampshire. And he was telling me about the um, talking with an old timer, an, you know, back in the 60s, somebody who'd been involved in the Canterbury community 30 or 40 years earlier and talking about scything and mowing hay fields with 30 or 40 people mowing. And I feel like uh, songs happening or being a part of that, that uh, system. The other thing I read was uh, about Simple Gifts being a spiritual work song. And um, I, when I read that first, I thought, well, here's a work song. You know, it, it really makes sense. It says here in the description, people often describe it as a spiritual work song. Um, now, some people say, well, that's the work is the spiritual work. <laughs> sure. On the other hand, but their lives are all, there's so much of Shaker life. Anytime you go to a Shaker village, you see just how deeply life is, is a part yeah. of it. So I can't imagine... The, th the thought I always have when I'm mowing, I mow with a scythe, uh, it's just perfect for song. It's so mm -hmm. perfect for song, the way it opens your chest, the rhythm of mowing. Same when I'm chopping, I have a double bitted ax, which every once in a while I'll go out and chop and try some of the lumber, the lumber camp, the lumber camp song or the shanties from the, the, uh, the small, what they called shanties, the huts in the North woods where they would stay while right. working and so many of those songs are ballads and they don't have a sort of call and response uh element that i that often works to coordinate people at work but is not of course essential to work songs um but i really even even some of the ballads when you think about when you're chopping and you've got a song like um sing around uh mm -hmm. it's from the uh, the Northwood songster, I think, or Minstrelsy of Maine. It's got just this, when we go into the woods. Oh, I think John Goller may have sung it on my, in my uh, film. That's for, right. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> it's got uh, such, well, it's actually drink round, but we changed it to sing round. Because, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, we've got some, some folks who have had drinking issues, drinking problems. And we just thought, well, let's just sing around. And it works, it works well that way. But anyway, so many of the songs have this uh, rhythm that comes well. The, the Lumberman's Alphabet is another one that we sang, I think. It's just got this great rhythm. I can't imagine. Once you see the, the images of um, the Alan Lomax and, uh, no, uh, it was uh, Bruce Jackson and um, what uh, Toshi Seeger maybe in, um, sure, in Texas. Yeah of the uh, live oak chopping live oak and singing it just to me it's just well okay prop probably what would happen is every once in a while there'd be a lumber whoever was the lumberjack who was great at singing would sing whatever he had while he was out there chopping and they didn't have four people on a tree or eight people on a tree like in texas necessarily but you can make the woods ring 
You can make mm-hmm. the blues ring when you're out there. So I think it's maybe more of a thing that it wasn't glorified or it wasn't as common um, here in New England. But I can't imagine that it didn't happen sometimes, especially when you consider that a lot of the farmers and lumberjacks were also working on boats. They would take some time sailing the lumber to the Caribbean and coming back, learning shanties. Um, I think it even talks about that in Cold Cords, uh, in the introduction to Cold Cords book, um, Roll and Go. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, it was sort of a fluid uh, interchange of of spaces and activities. And it, it would be very common to have somebody from a boat end up in the woods or end up in the fields. And I just can't imagine that the songs they were learning on the boats or uh, weren't making their way into the woods and vice versa and sort of informing them. And to sure. me, since we have work to do, that's all I really need. That's, 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 all, <laughs> that's all we really need is to know that it, yeah, it may have happened um, and it certainly can work now. Yeah, and I mean, one thing you mentioned, you know, the idea of the spiritual work song, and it, it may be true, of course, that the that the work involved is spiritual work, but we know from our field recordings in the American Folklife Center archive that spirituals were used as work songs for physical labor as well, certainly. So there's no reason, as you say, that it might not have been <laughs> used that way during farming, and you have uh, you have the anecdotal evidence anyway that people certainly did that. Um, so that's, yeah, that's all just great stuff. And it's, it's, it's nice to see how these can be used in different ways. I mean, one of the things that you did, you opened your concert with a version of the cambric shirt, which, you know, is one of those classic, really old ballads, but it has a refrain and that makes it possible to use it as a work song. Yeah. So what was it like adapting that for field work? um <laughs> or for, for work in the field i should say yeah <laughs> uh it was pretty natural the the interesting thing about that song is that you know the more i do this the more i realize you get out into the field with someone with people and the simpler the better the simpler the refrain the better um it'll be a mix of people some of the folks i'll be out there with are have been by my by my side for 10 years singing or more others this will be their first time they they heard about it from someone and they said oh we've got to go check this out and they'll be brand new so when they, when those folks show up i try to have the simplest possible refrain fum a lum a lie fum a lie that is so easy to get mm-hmm. it, hard, there's hardly anything to it and that's part of its genius and I, the more <laughs> the more i do this the more i'm looking for those songs that are deceptively they're deceptively simple in the sense that if it if you were arranging a set list to be on stage you might think well why we're not going to do the cambric shirt you know it's it is it's it's too simple but um in the field uh it actually ends up being more deeper a deeper experience because of the simplicity of the song uh simple gifts is the same way um it's uh once you kind of get into the rhythm of the song, once you get over the learning part of the, then everyone's actually making music together rather than learning music together. And there's a really big difference, especially when you apply it, when you've got garlic to pull, you know, you just, <laughs> yeah. like you can't spend any time really explaining what's going on or what to do. It almost has to present itself, it has to explain itself. And uh, the cambric shirt does that. A lot of the, you know, the lumberman's alphabet. A lot of the great songs that we use uh, have that sort of almost self-explanatory. You can just sing it at a drop of a hat. A lot of the shanties are like that. You know, it's almost like we have inside of us a, an intuitive knowledge of <laughs> what to do in some of these songs. You get in a room and, and you know, you sing uh, "Hall on the Bolin," and people just know where to sing <laughs> they just know how to do it and that's those are the ones we want if we're going to get the job done well yeah and it was adaptive too of course because the position that that a, a crew would have been in on a ship is pretty much similar to the to the situation that you guys are in in the fields which is not everyone will know every song so it's you know the easiest thing is to have these songs that are simple and can be you know uh 
can be learned on the spot so you don't have to spend too much time on the learning part so that all that all really makes a lot of sense so um and that song we should mention the cambric shirt came from the main folklife center which is a collection that has been acquired by the american folklife center so that was what we call an archive challenge you were learning a piece that is actually in our archive and using it um in your concert so we thank you for for doing that with us yeah. as well that was a lot of fun oh man we love i i just love the concept what an awesome concept to have uh get people out there you know the songs were collected they weren't collected to sit on the shelves you know they right. really weren't that. they were collected to be used and sung and enjoyed and made new again made fresh whatever whatever it is that people need to do and i i believe so deeply in that um that as a, co a concept like that's why we're out collecting if we're collecting music that's why we're collecting it yeah we believe that too so thank you so much again and um i uh, another thing that i'll mention you you um had talked about uh finding materials in joanna colcord's uh books so what what was your connection was that just through having been a sailor and and knowing that that was the best resource out there yeah uh, well, I, I only, it took a long time actually to figure out that cold cord was my, was, was the one for me, mm -hmm. um, on the schooner, we had a copy of, um, Hugel. And actually then when I went to work, the first farm I worked on, it's called Quill Hill farm in Amagansett, New York. One of my coworkers had grown up, uh, near mystic Connecticut. And he had he had met Stan Hugel and had a copy and he gave me his copy and signed by Stan Hugel. So he was like, Bennett, you need to have this. So I, I took it. So I was really operating out of Hugel for a long time. And only later did I um, kind of I, I, it was really it's been this whole process of food and music and thinking more about how our place that we are um, affects the things that we're enjoying or the things we're creating, right? So the, the ecology, the climate, um, uh, the, the, the culture of the place, it somehow, when you get all, when you get the place lined up with the product, it's stronger, it's stronger. It's like, if you're going to grow a, um, potato in Maine, it makes sense to grow a potato that has, it co-evolved with Maine's climate. And mm -hmm. uh, the more I, I play music, um, and I've got, I've gotten to play music from all over the world and I've gotten to play it all over the world. The more I do it, the more the songs of Maine where I grew up, um, and even this Bay Penobscot Bay and this, this little, this, this amazing little corner of, of the world, um, they serve, they serve better. They, they, they just works better. And it's, I think, because of the alignment, you know, the songs here, they help us, they've helped, whether if, you know, sailing or the Shaker community surviving um, or, or people just getting through the win w winter in the woods, um, it's helped, it's worked in these exact scenarios for, you know, yeah. in some, you know, hundreds of years. So, uh, same with the potatoes. And, yeah. um, <laughs> so, so I, that's how I ended up coming around a cold cord because mm -hmm. I was, I was looking for resources relating to what people were singing here around here and on, on with this exact logical path, you know, okay, well, let's see what works here. And that's, I ended up coming around a cold cord and, and, of course, Floored, she's the next town over. And one yeah. of the members of my chorus is her uh, great nephew. So oh, kind of cool that way, you know, there's still cold cords around. You just run into cold cords. Yeah. Um, well, so, uh, uh, you know, we, we invite you anytime you, you have a chance to come to Washington and come to the Library of Congress. One of the things that's cool about cold cord from our perspective we don't have her collection but she used to write to the heads of our archive all the time hmm. with suggestions um and so we have a lot of letters from joanna colcord and in fact some of our great collections of shanties are from sailors that she suggested to oh. alan lomax and the oh, others cool. uh duncan emmerich she would write 
letters to us saying you really need to get you know collect from this person so <laughs> so oh, yeah I'm bring sure. bring her great nephew as well <laughs> we yeah. would love to meet him so oh yeah yeah, yeah bill colcord great guy um sounds good i think uh the more we do it you know it's maine is a special place i live in a special place but everyone lives in a special place actually once you sort of uh untap this idea that uh, we we co-evolve with our places and our arts co-evolve with our places. The, the beauty of the Library of Congress to me is that you have these little seeds from all over the country, all over the world uh, that are housed there. You're like a seed bank for mm -hmm. all this great, this great art, music, art, ideas. And as people who live in Washington State or who live in Texas or Florida, I, I, just, I think about all of the stuff you have from all the corners of this country. Anyone can come and plant, you know, discover the seeds of their place and bring them home and plant them again. I just think it's the coolest thing. Yeah. Library of Congress as seed bank. And I, and I want to thank you for, you know, making it happen because it's like an American treasure and you've got it well, in your good hands. Yeah, you're very welcome. And we, we, we do love to repatriate materials to communities. You know, sometimes for whatever reason, the materials that we collect here end up being lost by the communities of origin. And we've, we've spent a lot of time and effort in contacting communities and, and repatriating some of our materials as well. Hmm. Um, I think the, the main material is for the most part pretty safe in, in both places. Um, but it's kind of cool to have some materials that folks from Maine might not know about and would be able to come and listen to here at the Library of Congress as well. Definitely. So, yeah, and so the resources, we welcome people all the time. I think in terms of like the budgets and staffing that you guys have down there, are they're bigger than what we've been able to muster here in Maine. You know, the, yeah. our library system just hasn't been able to muster lately the, the um, money and people that are needed to sort of help us access it. So, since you guys are there, you have you can help us access. I mean, that to me, that's huge. Not every community, even if you were to to sort of give us all of that material and we were to keep it in Maine, we may not be able to sort of fund it, fund the things that it needs. So right. you know, we can all work together and and you know, just the material is is just that it exists. It's such a amazing thing. Well, thank you. So to get back a little bit toward the, you know, your sort of process with work songs, um, one of the, you know, sort of traditions that we know about from all work song traditions is the the process of sort of creating new words for work songs. That is to say, the song wasn't necessarily the same length as the task and people would spin out new verses. Do you find yourself doing that? Is that part of what your chorus does as well? Oh yeah, ad nauseum. I mean, it's it's one of the most, I would say, it um it's uh one of the defining characteristics of this art form um is that it's a tradition of spontaneous invention and um especially in folks who've come up in traditions that uh see things as being rigid um you know as being unchanged they see tradition as unchanging um this tradition uh it's pretty it's just clear that innovation is is a core bedrock part of it you know if you're gonna if you're gonna spend you don't know how long this particular row of garlic is going to take <laughs> and right. so you got to pat it otherwise it's unsatisfying to everyone if you just end with the verses you know you just end with the verses you know then the energy just dip, starts to dip you know whatever the verses were in the book um you gotta like make up three more in order to get to the end of the row. Otherwise, you're gonna have this team of people at your disposal for less amount of time because they're gonna lose interest. They're gonna get tired. Whenever we're not singing, people get way more tired and they don't last as long. It's it's simple math, it's economics, it's let's okay. I want these people here as long as they wanna stay. And so the more the more you do it. The, the more you invent lyrics and oh, it's almost always, they know when you're inventing lyrics, pretty much, not always. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can slide them in and, and they don't, they think, it, oh, that's the one my grandfather, grandfather taught me. But uh, <laughs> the, 
the uh, the inventive lyrics, they're so great because you can include them in the song. And once you do that, you've got them. You know, they're not they're Then suddenly they have such ownership over this thing that they're doing. They this is my they, you know, they, just, they just own it and they'll work to the end of the row. They'll work till the end of the day and they'll they'll work harder and faster the the longer we go. It's the craziest thing. Most people who run teams in a field would not these days. They just wouldn't. They don't believe. They actually don't believe me when I when I'm talking. About it. They don't right. believe me. But then when they come and see it, it it really they say, "Wow, yeah, wow, this really is something else." And and the best songs are usually at the end, like the best energy. Say we're quitting at five. Well, that four thirty to five time is usually when people are dragging, but somehow. Everybody just like leaves it, leaves it out there. It's just, we're going to leave it out here in the field. And we're, it's like the energy goes up and up and up right to the very end. And same with jogging. We, we jog and sing in the sort of uh, Jody call tradition. Um, uh, we'll, we'll run for three, four or five miles. And at the end, it'll be stronger. You know, we'll finish strong and the song is the thing that gets you there. Same with rowing. When we mm -hmm. row and sing, it's it's just sure. uh, it's it's pretty great. And and often the inventiveness is the thing that <laughs> that'll that'll take it over the top. And I, you know, it's uh, that that Bruce Jackson work that he's done in, in his book Wake Up Dead Man is so yeah. cool because he you know collected all of the inventions. Um, where some of the older collections of songs seem to be like, well, we'll we'll sort of choose some of the best and put those in there because it's maybe more expensive. We can't publish 30 verses or yeah, sometimes you see 30 verses, but Jackson, he gave all the verses and then like different versions of the song with the different verses. And you can see just the extent to which invention was a part of the of the Texas, uh, you know, Mississippi, the sort of the Southern prison work song tradition. And and but then you see it in shanty books. You see it talked about in shanty books. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's. Um, I'd say it's, and it also you know in um, in Tanzania it was big invention. You know they would invent the song sometimes the, the morning before they went out, but also add lyrics in the middle of the song to extend right. it. Um, I should think about in Mongolia. I should ask my teacher over there because he he would there were these long epic songs about the mountains and um the animals and women and horses and and they would go on and on and i can only imagine that there's invention happening there as well it's probably more the norm than the exception the there's a tradition in lazio in italy north of rome um, um singing shepherds um, spontaneously improvising as they sing from pasture to pasture across the hedgerow. And um, I think Lomax may have recorded some of that material in his big Italian tour that he did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, uh, this idea that we're going to spice up the moment with a little bit of linguistic clever cleverness, I, you know, that's like, it, it seems like a real pinnacle of human uh, artistic expression. If you ask me, it's like, wow, well, here Absolutely, we are. We're going to, yeah. we're going to take this suffering, this moment of intense hardship, and we're going to use our, our wits to make just this awesome verse that captures the moment that names people in this, <laughs> names our surroundings that it, that expresses the angst that we have with the boss and his cruelty, you know, that it, the sun and it's heat, whatever it is. Uh, right. I think the Greeks were even doing it. And I think that uh, the fact that it sort of survived in this com almost completely unsung way is, is, a, is a bit of a, a, a secret to life. And I just hope that more, more folks find out about it and start to try it because the rewards are enormous. Yeah. Well, thanks also because so many of the collections that you mentioned, those collections by Alan Lomax and Bruce Jackson are ones that we're taking care of here at the Library of Congress as well. <laughs> nice. um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's great to hear that people are using these archival collections in these ways and sort of 
thinking about them in terms of what their implications are in a broader sense as well. So oh, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah, um, well, we sing, I, we sing songs out of all those collections uh, pretty great. regularly. And for you guys, we wanted to highlight the main material that we do. Sure. Um, it's sort of our, it's the thing we can really provide to the world that's different. But we get a lot out of the, those other songs too, particularly sort of like structural, almost there's a structural practical side and then this metaphysical uh, side as well. So Yeah. Well, speaking of the metaphysical side, um, you've mentioned several times um, Shaker communities, and of course they're deeply connected to Maine as well. Um, what can you tell me about that and where, where did you find the Shaker songs that you do? Well, uh, Simple Gifts was um, taught, is taught in Maine schools um, and I probably around the country, you know, people seem to know that sure. song. And I don't know if it was the 60s and the folk revival that, that did that or something else. But um, I mean, of course, it's, it's an amazing song. So it deserves its, its place in culture for sure. So I learned that in first grade, Mrs. Everard, uh, Appleton Village School. But um, I came back around to it. I think it was talking with Dudley and other folks living over in Canterbury, actually, New Hampshire. Um, Dudley Lofman, of course, is a, is a major uh, Northern New England songster and fiddle dance caller, dance master, um, but also has a great collection of songs and tunes that he plays on his various uh, instruments. And so I think Dudley was talking, sort of pointed me in the direction of the Shakers and said, you know, hey, <laughs> you should really like dive in a little bit more to see what, what's going on in that world. And um, then uh, I started finding more stuff. You know, I, I teach work songs with an organization in Western Massachusetts called Roots Rising, which brings um, urban and suburban kids together to work on farms, local farms. And one of the farms is at the Hancock Shaker Village in mm -hmm. uh, Western Mass. And uh, in preparation, I've been doing that for 10 years. And in preparation for that, I started diving more deeply into um, the Shaker songbooks that I could find, and one of which is here in Maine, nearby at uh, the Bagaduce Music Lending Library, which is a really extraordinary music of uh, sheet music lending library here in Blue Hill, Maine. Um, over a million copies of music. You know, it, I think it's one of the world's largest independent, freely accessible sheet music lending libraries. And they have several books of Shaker songs, and I was diving into them several years ago and started seeing just a whole lot more uh, than, than simple gifts. They're, you know, <laughs> there are these songs that have incredible rhythm and power. And the, just from what I can see, the description was that they were singing them while dancing and, you know, shaking. But um, uh, to me, especially the ones, there are wordless songs. There, there's a whole collection. I mean, vast collection of songs that have no words. And when I just apropos to our the way we started this conversation, these songs that have no words are gold in the field because you have people who they can <laughs> think of what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to pull garlic. We're asking them to learn a new melody. We're asking them to learn words to a new melody. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we're even asking them to sing, try on some harmonies. And then you've got your rhythm and your dynamics. We're asking them to sing loud, which is probably new for them. Most people who sing inside or with electronics don't, you know, with microphone sound reinforcement, they don't have, it's a whole new thing to learn to just project, to just use your entire lungs and sing outside. Um, so we're asking them to do a lot. If you can eliminate the fact that words need to happen and just use uh, vocables or just deedle Irish style or, or trall in Scandinavian style, it makes it a, a lot easier for people. So I, I haven't gone too deeply into the, I, like I need to basically get five or six or 10 or 12 shaker songs in my pocket, you know, and just sing those a lot because I think they, they'll be transformative in making people feel welcome and just drop right in. You know, I have a friend who farms in Gouldsboro Shepsi Eaton, and he went to India and studied kirtan. 
And he yeah. sings a lot of kirtan in the field. And I'll go over and help and we'll sing kirtan together. And those uh, Hindu incantations are very simple. They've got this same, uh, actually, I think the parallel with shaker music is very interesting because they've got this uh, almost wordless quality, especially if you don't speak um, Hindi, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. it sounds with connected to amazing melodies and you can be out there thinning beats for uh, all day and it's boring as all get out, but you get this song and it just keeps you going and it doesn't need words and you just go. It's pretty cool. So that, that's my, that's my hope. And I got to get over and talk with brother Arnold. And I was so excited that you, we'd sort of were paired. I was paired with the shakers for the, this, this, uh, this piece that you guys did because it was like a, a reminder. Okay. Well, they were doing choral arrangements and that's fine. But I think that, brother arnold and and all of the shakers who went before would be really interested in what we're doing with our with our uh farm and our community i think that I, I it just seems to fit in a way you know it really you have these moments of transcendent euphoric connection with the universe and it, it sounds weird <laughs> saying this on the screen and it sounds unusual we don't talk about that sort of experience transcendental experience in american life very commonly and um it's easy to feel uh mocked or misunderstood for even saying it but the reality is i'll get done with a project and singing with my community and i'll have more energy than when i started i'll mm -hmm. feel this overpowering connection with each of them this sort of kinship and and also a taste a sort of presence uh uh It'll, it'll even transform the way I see the world. Like I'll see trees in greater fidelity. I'll see the spaces in between the branches and the songs somehow bring that out. They, they have this incredible lifting and in the spirit, they, they just bring out the spirit. And I, you see that in cultures all over the world, of course. And, and I think the shakers get, they got it. That's what they were up to. I can't imagine they were up to anything else other than transcending this space, feeling intense euphoria through music together. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. So um, to talk a little about other projects or projects that's, that are related to your work song experience um, and just things that you've done and, and achieved, um, I think it's really interesting, for example, that you've done State Department tours um, sort of focusing on music. What can you tell us about that? man it's amazing that the fact that we can spend a tiny fraction of our of our defense department budget or our our uh, our massive budget that goes into dealing with things outside of our borders right we got a huge budget and we can spend some fraction of it sending out cultural ambassadors to show a different side of what america is because they they're getting either they're seeing military or they're seeing uh, mass media, Hollywood. To have a, a guy who's farming and playing the fiddle and singing in the fields and rowing boats, have him show up in Ukraine um, or Mongolia, both trips that I've done. Uh, I think it really, first of all, it's an honor to represent that, you know, this part of America, which I think you think about America the Beautiful, this these folk traditions, to me, that's America the Beautiful. And to share that with people and say, yeah, this is first of all what happens first of all, what happens is when they see me performing a folk tradition, then their folk traditions are suddenly um, validated because I think the message folks get it from a lot of American media is that you've got to be a part of an industrial, um, industrial capitalist or digital capitalist culture. You yeah. could say a, a culture that prizes very few industrially polished art makers, art, art music makers, um, or even it's even beyond art music. It's like um, just money music. It's music that's made <laughs> yeah. to sell. Just sell as many things, many little widgets as possible. Crank them out, and. Um, when I, Ukraine, I think particularly Ukraine, but also Mongolia, the traditional musicians that I got to play alongside and, and swap songs and tunes with, 
I could see them just sort of feeling like, oh yeah, yeah, we have something special here. And and to have an American show up and acknowledge that meant a lot for the community surrounding the traditional musician. And uh, and there's just been cool music that we made together. It, there's a fun video. I had my my five minutes of fame were in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, when when uh, we collaborated with a local, really fantastic local group called Altai, and we mashed up Wayfaring Stranger and one of the, you know, the great American folk song, Way Poor Wayfaring Stranger. And then with, uh, it just meshed really well with one of their traditional songs, which was about riding horses. And um, it got broadcast on Mongolian TV and, and made its way around the internet. And it just, it was just a beautiful thing to make that music together. Same in Ukraine, we discovered that that fiddle tune Spotted Pony um, has an almost identical uh, B section, no, A section as a, a really common Ukrainian folk melody. So, uh, you know, these sorts of moments, you bring people together, it helps everybody realize, you know, breaks down the walls. I think one of the real issues we have in life, it definitely in folk music and music generally, is the idea that we're putting everything in boxes, and the categorization of things, uh, whether it's, uh, well, is this a work song? Is this not a work song? Is this an American song or is this a Ukrainian song? Um, it's It helps us understand things. You know, we got to put things in boxes in order to understand them in a way. But also we lose the <laughs> we lose a lot when we we put them in the boxes. It's a real conundrum, I think, behind human, I guess, thought. Uh, but yeah. but when anytime you get a chance to sort of uh, explode the boxes or or <laughs> draw the connections between the boxes, a sort of interdisciplinary connection. Uh, it gets really good really fast, and uh, I'm grateful for the State Department for for their for the you know American Music Abroad program, and also just some of those embassies are out there just hiring American musicians and bringing them over, so completely separate from you know American Music Abroad. They're just bringing us over to play music at their embassy and in in various outposts around the country. I, I just think that is. That's some enlightened foreign policy, and the more we can do that, the better. All right, and it's interesting, you know, putting as you were talking about uh, the fiddle tune that resembled uh, the Ukrainian tune, as well as not putting things in boxes. And one thing that we should mention is that in addition to singing songs, you also play the fiddle. Um, yeah. So we don't want to put you in that box of just the folk <laughs> singer. So talk a little bit about your fiddling life as well. Okay, well, I play. Uh, really uh, contra dance music. Uh, let's see. I'm a bluegrass musician. So I have a bluegrass band. I play a lot of contra dance music. Um, contra dances are still really big in Maine. Um, mm -hmm. or we could say they've, it's been revived over the last 30, 40 years. And uh, with the Gawler family and with my band Drive Train, um, I've gotten to play a lot of contra dances. Um, which feels really, it feels like a return to my youth because I grew up contra dancing and also my grandfather called contra dances and my uncle is a dance caller. Also my sister, her husband and her husband's sister start re relaunched the Belfast contra dance and it's one of the best in the country. It's just amazing. People of all ages dancing unselfconsciously mm -hmm. uh, here in Belfast, almost like uh, they just stumble out of the woods or the barn or wherever. It's not a subculture. It feels like actually part of just the culture here. So, so it's been fun to take that uh, around the country um, and the world, teaching uh, contra dancing and playing fiddle or guitar um, with whoever uh, you know, whichever band I'm with. Um, there's a cool. Uh, it ties in with work songs pretty pretty directly, just in the sense that you've got this sort of caller and then the response is a dance <laughs> instead of a call and response with a with a group of workers you get call and response with the with the dancers and and uh it's fun I, I get to play with a fiddler named ed howe from whitefield maine who's just amazing and people call him from all over the country to come play their dances you know they most folks outside of the community don't even realize that there's this massive 
uh, contra dance culture happening all over the country and mm -hmm. range halls and community centers and churches. And um, so we've been, we've been to all corners of the country uh, just pre pandemic, Arizona, California, um, North Carolina, all over the place playing these dances. And when you get to play with great musicians, uh, which I luckily get to, um, it just, it takes it to a whole nother level. So we're, we're, we're the neat thing about both the Gawler family and Drivetrain and Ed Howe is that we really have the same idea. We want to play main tunes. We want to play main tunes because there's something fiery about the tunes that ended up in our archive up here. I don't know what it is. Ellen Gawler says she moved to Maine from Vermont because the, it was actually the way that the tunes were played. They've played with fire in their bows, she says. And and the tunes, though, the tunes reinforce it. Something about there's this up, there's this real fire behind it. Um, I think the backbeat, I also think my other side belief is the rhythm itself uh, has it inside. We play like a particular type of boom chick. Um, and I, I'm often tasked with the guitar, so I get to do the boom chick. And I think... right. And, and, and interestingly, my other theory is that it came from the Caribbean uh, in the connection between main ships sailing from here, bringing ice and hay and wood to the Caribbean and back. It's just a week sail. All kinds yeah. of people would pile onto those schooners, the coasters, and, and sail down to Barbados and Jamaica. And they had to be hearing music going on and, and then sailing home and had it. And then they've got to play for a dance. So to me, it just makes... So much sense why our music would sound so much like Rocksteady, our our backbeat, you know, our rhythmic approach. The fiddle tunes is a lot like Rocksteady and, and early reggae. So that's and a little... certainly if you're gonna if you're gonna contrast it with Vermont, you know, what is it that Maine had that Vermont didn't have? And that's one of the things, I guess, certainly. Yes. Is that 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 particular trade route. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very now that cool. maybe that's a PhD project in the making. Yeah, right? for some anyone yeah. wants it. <laughs> Take it on because I think I think there's something there, and and it and it really gets to the nice um, diversity piece, which often people think about Maine. Well, it's it's a white state. There's there's no diversity in Maine, but I actually think that we've got an incredible amount of diversity, and it's evidenced in the music. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I we have uh, there, there's a woman named Emily Emmeline Dean Reynolds who's studying black fiddlers. And Maine actually has a collection of black fiddlers, believe it or not, in our archive, in our tradition. I'm not sure if it's in the Library of Congress. I'll have to find out where nice. she's, what she's looking at. But also the um, the Franco connection and the, the cross-border connection uh, with Canada. You just see this constant. It seems like the the impulse is to share and connect. That's what that's what we're seeing. That's what I think is is the thing, which which makes sense that that our backbeat would be so much like Jamaican backbeat. Um, yeah. You know, this, this impulse to share and connect, and that's what I'm really interested in continuing. Anytime we get a chance to make music together. And this summer I get a chance to play with uh, Jerron Paxton, Blind Boy Paxton, yeah. uh, who was raised, you know, in Los Angeles, but from a grandmother who grew up on a plantation um, in uh, the deep South. And, He's got all these songs, but he knew Woodchopper's real. He just knew Woodchopper's, which, you know, is a great, a great tune. And he was ready to play it. And he was ready to play it um, in, in a way that brought out the commonalities or the similarities between the two of us. And we're, we couldn't be more different on so many levels, <laughs> you know, but, but then we've got this amazing musical uh, intersection and it just seemed like even as different as we seem the Venn diagram is vast the overlap is huge and so that you know um, I'm kind of rambling here but to me that's what it's all about it's why I love the Library of Congress it's why I'm proud to do the music I do and when we're playing contra dances or singing work songs doing workshops different places that's what I, that's I think what what I try to emphasize and what I think everybody should really focus on, especially in a country that feels sometimes really divided right now. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that. And, you know, we are coming toward the end of our time. So I wanted to make sure if there was any project or principle that you wanted to articulate for our audience that you haven't had a chance to say yet, um, 
this is the time if you want to any anything you think hasn't been answered at this point yeah well i guess the last thing i don't think i've said this yet is anybody can do this it doesn't require professional education um Anyone can use the Library of Congress and look up, find old materials and bring them back to life. Um, anyone can use them as a setting off point for creating their own music at whatever work they have that needs to be done. We all need to wash the dishes and sweep the floor. Um, no matter where we are, there's stuff that needs to be done. And music can be a part of it. I'm telling you, it's a transformative thing. It makes it better. It makes it easier. It really does. Uh, it can help to to learn the stuff while you're not working. Excuse me. Take a little time to learn some lyrics and melodies while you're not working. If there's nobody around to teach you, you know, sit yourself down and learn a few song, learn a few shanties, and then um, try them out while you're washing the dishes and sweeping the floor and whatever your work is. It, you know, it may be that you work at a computer all day and you're a spreadsheet jockey and it can be hard uh, to figure out how to have music in a in an office setting. Um, but even then, outside of that office, well, there's whole things that can be done in offices, even office choirs is a, is a thing in, in England. And I think maybe even starting or pre pandemic, starting over here, taking an hour after lunch to have a chorus and then staying an hour later at the end. Um, but jogging, rowing, uh, think of all the exercise that folks are doing. Uh, th to me, there's just ample opportunities to use music to in, enhance your work, whatever that work is. And I would encourage you to do it. There's no tryouts. It's, it's mostly here. It's mostly deciding to do it and deciding to be okay with whatever people think about you because you're singing. And, uh, you know, that didn't used to be as much of a problem. It is these days. And, but that's our work. We get to just learn how to not care as much about right. what people think about us. So, well, Bennett Kinesny, thank you so much for your the interview that you just gave us and also the concert that you gave us of work songs with your community chorus. It was just a, a great experience to have that concert and to have you here to talk to us. So Bennett Kinesny, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. And, and keep up the good work down there. I can't wait to come visit in person and paw through those uh, letters from Joanna Colcord and, and everything else. I mean, obviously, what a what a gift you guys are are saving for the world. So keep it up and we'll see you soon. Will do. We look forward to having you.